luce ne costa lacrime sta America a noi napolitana noi cance di animo si è la Napolo come amare sto pana I'm a musician and I came to this country 36 years ago but not to play this type of music there's a lot of piano, saxophone, trumpet, guitar nowadays, but not too much harmonica. So, but I really fell in love with it, you know. My name is Enrico Granafe. I was born and raised in southern Italy. I grew up in the city of Cosenza. I live in uh, Montclair. New Jersey, the United States, and the reason I'm here uh, is because uh, together with my wife I used to run a very important jazz club called Trumpets, which was actually still is right here in this building. I've been a musician my entire life and my first instrument was the guitar. I started very late in life. I was 15 years old when I learned the first song, which was uh, Il Ragazzo della Via Gluck. Questa è la storia di uno di noi, anche lui nato per caso in Via Gluck. Well, I'm sure some of you will recognize the tune because it was very, very popular in the 60s. At some point, very late, I must say, I was already 19 years old when I decided to learn how to read music. And later on, I went to the Conservatory of Music and I got a degree in classical guitar. You know, the classical stuff, like... <laughs> you know, things like... Uh... I grew up in the small city of Cosenza, in the northern part of Calabria, approximately 70,000 inhabitants. Cosenza is a pretty city. It's, uh, it's in a valley, and uh, if you travel west, you can be on the beach in 25 minutes, and if you travel east, you can be on the mountains in 25 minutes. But when I say mountains, I mean where you can actually ski in winter. Calabria is a very interesting region, uh, also because there are some ethnic minorities that not too many people know about. The most important one is the Albanians. Cosenza is in the middle of, uh, of a bunch of Albanian communities. So, um, for, for a kid in school, you know, it was, it, it was really very, very common to have a couple of uh, schoolmates who would speak Italian with a very heavy accent and who, who would talk to each other in this strange language that nobody could understand. And uh, Albanians in Calabria and well, all over southern Italy are very proud of their origins and they consider themselves Albanian, you know, even after so many, so many centuries. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you talk to, to, to people uh, who don't have too much education, I mean, they actually apologize for their accent. Uh, I'm sorry if I speak like this, but I'm Albanian. Uh, <clears throat> but that's not all. Then there's uh, also uh, an Occitan minority. Uh, there's, a, there's a little town called La Guardia Piemontese on the west coast. The Waldensians, who left Piedmont, obviously, Guardia Piemontese, mm -hmm. uh, for religious reasons, for religious freedom. Uh, also in the south, <clears throat> you have the Greeks, you know, have uh, uh, Rogudi and Bava, where people speak Greek. 
Calabria, after all, was the Magna Grecia, the Great Greece. It was the biggest Greek colony. Uh, as a matter of fact, Pythagoras, you know, who, who was Greek, he was actually born in Calabria. I loved other cultures and languages. When I was 16 years old, I could already express myself decently in English, French, and Spanish. And uh, um, you might take this for granted, but you have to understand that back then, in the late 60s, in southern Italy, language learning was not so accessible as you might think. And uh, you really had to make an effort uh, to learn language. And I started learning English with the Linguafon course. Linguafon was a company based in England that produced courses in, in I don't know, 30-something languages. So I bought my English course and I started studying. And then I started studying French uh, following a course on TV uh, that uh, was aired uh, at lunchtime every day. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody in my family was pissed because instead of eating, you know, I wanted to watch this course. But what happened was, this is an interesting story. Uh, one day, the mechanic across the street sent for me because he had a problem. You know, he had uh, uh, a dushvo uh, with four French kids uh, that broke down. And... Uh, he had to explain to them uh, that the, 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 the car was basically uh, useless at that point. They had to send for the parts, you know, and uh, in the meantime, they had to be in Cosenza for, for a couple of, well, two of them actually went back to, uh, to France and the other two stayed and I was with them the whole time. Um, you know, I took care of them as well as I could. You know, I could not invite them to my house because uh, uh, I was uh, I was a leftist back then. You know, I mean, we're talking about uh, about early seventies here. You know, uh, so the scene, the political scene, was very hot. And on top of that, my father was a cop, so you can imagine the atmosphere in my house. But anyway, I would spend time with them. You know, they really appreciated it, and in exchange, they, they uh, helped me to improve my French. Tous les mots d'argot, uh, la nana, le mec, uh, le toubib, les godasses, uh, t'en as pas marre d'être con. Uh, you know, all things that, uh, you, like I said, you might take for granted now because there is so much access to language learning. Uh, you know, you just have to turn on your computer and go to YouTube, and you can learn anything you want. But back then, was uh, was really a big deal. So anyway, from a musical point of view, you know, I also explored different styles uh, that had to do with other cultures. And one of them was, uh, was Albanian music, because you have to understand that uh, mm, uh, in Calabria, there's a lot of uh, Albanian communities uh, the Albanians have been there for over 500 years. You know, they left, some of them left Albania because of the Turkish invasion. And they settled in southern Italy, and after 500 years, they still speak the language. Can you imagine? Uh, so I did a research on Albanian music, and that brought me to Albania eventually, to Albania when Albania was still under Enver Hoxha, you know, uh, the dictator. I presented a, a repertoire with my friend Judita de Tassantis, actress and singer, uh, a program of, Alba of Italian Albanian songs. And then over there, I met uh, Simon Gioni, who was one, like, well, one of the most important composers, and he gave me a copy, a handwritten copy of his most famous composition that is still now very, um, very well known in, uh, in Albania. It's called Lulebor. Tui kerku e mare kader, tui prelule kit me dor, vec nje kaps do bukur skader, tude djeta lule bar, je vagel par i 
Sverige platt Tycker gajen Tarsa mat Tarsa mat Hon tycker gajen Zimme ju Jätanta choy I even wrote a song in Albanian uh, which was recorded in the um, Institute of uh, of Popular Music actually a popular culture in Tirana and um, you know I did a lot of a lot of things uh, and as a as a as a citizen of the kingdom of the two Sicilies of course I loved uh, Neapolitan music you know we we used to grow up with uh, listening to 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 Neapolitan songs you know uh, okay you know stuff like this <laughs> Dimana ma vorrei partire stasera Lontana no, non ci resisto più Dice che c'è rimasta solo mare E lo stesso prima che la mare blu Una stere santa chiara Tengo cuore scuro scuro Ma perché, perché ogni sera pensa a Napolo com'era, pensa a Napolo com'è. And then, uh, of course, I explored the folk music of, of my own region, of Calabria. But um, uh, actually, I did more than that. I started writing songs um, in dialect in a Cosentino dialect, but uh, using, you know, modern music. And um, at some point, these songs became actually very well known in Cosenza. And uh, there's especially one called Ukujuriedru. Ukujuriedru is like a zeppole. You know, it's... Uh, it's something that uh, people make uh, around Christmas times. You know, it's like a donut. It's shaped like a donut, and it's made with flour and potatoes. You know, and uh, in uh, in Cosenza, it has this un this unusual name, Kudurijedru, which is actually quite difficult to pronounce for anybody who was not from there. Uh, this, uh, I did it as a bossa nova, so it's not like a, a folk tune per se. Quando fa fritta mi ricoglia sera Il viernes è già arrivato Mi sento arribusciato Ma pulatura è venata frissura Mi passa tutta quanta la paura Quando esce dall'uoglio, io solo chi so voglio, oi mamma come Pietro, fammi ne non non si è giù, oi gioia che ricrio, o cuggiù rietro, oi come Pietro, oi come Pietro, cuggiù rietro, cuggiù rietro. But when I was there, you know, I was was a young person and just wanted to get the hell out of there and travel and explore the world. So when I was 17 years old, I hitchhiked from Cosenza to London, UK, uh, with, a, with a friend of mine. Actually, I did it twice, two years in a row. And the second time, I remember that the UK was already in the European common market. Now, I'm not talking about EU, the European Union. No, not yet. Uh, but it was in the European common market. And as a consequence of that, I could actually work. You know, there were agencies that uh, would get jobs to, to, to young students, you know, uh, people who wanted to work as dishwashers or waiters. So I found a job as a dishwasher. In a, in a very, very fine restaurant. The, the chef was Italian, of course. This restaurant had uh, even Queen Elizabeth among uh, its, uh, its customers. But after a week, I got sick of it, you know, washing dishes, you know, every day. So uh, on a Sunday evening, when I got paid, 
the chef sent me uh, to the basement to get some coal. What did I do instead? I had the money in my pocket, so I just took off. <laughs> and I started busking around in Central Park. Oh boy, that was a lot of fun. Uh, my father had given me 60,000 lire, which was absolutely nothing. It was a ridiculous amount of money. You know, back then it was like, uh, I don't know, like 70 bucks, you know, to go to London and stay there for a month. <laughs> so when I arrived in London, I already had no more money. I had only 1,000 lire left. And uh, I actually survived for an entire month. And when I went back to Italy, hitchhiking also, of course, I still had the thousand liter in my pocket. <laughs> so, uh, at some point I fell in love with music, I started playing the guitar, etc., etc. And then I went to the conservatory and I moved to, uh, to uh, Rome. Uh, the conservatory was in L'Aquila. And I uh, moved there because I wanted to follow my, my teacher. Uh, Angelo Ferraro. Uh, he was a fine teacher and I want to finish my studies with him. Uh, so, but I didn't want to live in uh, L'Aquila because it was a small town, you know, I was living in Rome instead, which, you know, being the capital of Italy had a thriving musical scene. And of course I got into, into the scene very soon, but still as a classical guitarist, not, uh, not as a jazz harmonica player. You know, the harmonica was not in my, in my life yet. I had several uh, moments in my life. Uh, every once in a while I would fall in love with, uh, with a very specific musical genre. Like, for example, at some point I fell in love with, uh, with Baroque guitar music. And uh, I had a Baroque guitar made for, for me by Vincenzo de Bonis. Look at this. Look what a beauty. <laughs> and at some point, uh, a friend of mine who was a very fine jazz guitarist uh, talked about me to Pippo Caruso, who was a very important arranger. Uh, on TV, on national TV. So there was a show on a Sunday, I remember it was Easter Sunday, where he prepared uh, something with, uh, with the best guitar players in, in, in Italy. You know, he had, uh, he had a classical guitarist, legitimate classical guitarist, a blues player, he had two jazz guitarists, one of them was also played also very well Brazilian music and one of them his name was Michele Ascolese he told him uh, about me he said you know I have a friend who plays baroque guitar you know since you're doing something with a guitar maybe you know you should invite him and he did so uh, here I am with my uh, with my baroque guitar playing in front of millions of people that, that that was something you know it was light each guitarist was supposed to do something you know and it was all, only a small section of the uh, of the whole show you know it was a big show with with lots of stars and in, invited etc so i played um canarios by gaspar sanz who was a prominent spanish guitarist <laughs> I didn't want to live in L'Aquila. L'Aquila was a small city and there was no musical scene. Well, there was a conservatory, of course, you know, there were some concerts, but L'Aquila also happens to be only an hour away from Rome. So, you know, I, uh, I, I wasn't planning on living in, in L'Aquila. I wanted to be in the capital, you know, and be in the scene. And, uh, you know, some sacrifice was required because I had to uh, to commute. I had to get up, uh, not every day, but three days a week, I had to get up at six o'clock, take the bus, and uh, spend the whole day in L'Aquila. My personal life, my musical life, you know, other than the conservatory, 
was taking place in Rome. Rome was a great city. And then eventually I graduated in classical guitar, but it was not like a very glamorous thing. You know, I mean, I, I have always been instinctively self-taught. So my relationship with the schooling in general was always very bad, always very bad. I just uh, couldn't stand going to school as much as I liked to learn. When I took my exam, you know, I, I must say I didn't, uh, my playing was not very brilliant. And they gave me an option. They gave me two options. They said, look, I mean, you're not going to get a good grade. Why don't you come next year? Uh, I mean, yeah, you can pass, of course, but it's, uh, we don't think we should, you should do it. And I said, you know, fuck that. I don't care. I just want to get the hell out of here. So give me the grade that you like and <laughs> hell with it. And that's what happened. A few months later, something significant happened. I happened to meet a girl from Germany. So I fell madly in love with her and I decided to move to Germany. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be in the beautiful city of Freiburg in Breisgau, in the southwest corner of, uh, of the country, 15 kilometers from the French border and 60 kilometers from the Swiss border. So now I'm in Germany, but I don't speak one word of German. In spite of my love for uh, languages, uh, German was not really one of my favorite ones. Also because of some bad experiences that I had in that country. But that's too long to explain. But anyway, um, and uh, I looked for a job as a music teacher. And you know, it's funny because uh, German classical musicians have always had a kind of uh, love-hate relationship with, uh, with Italian music. And, uh, you know, just to give you an idea of what I mean, uh, Robert Schumann writes in his musical house on life rules, melody is the battle cry of dilettantes. And certainly, music without a melody is no music at all. But be clear about this. What they mean by melody is but something simple and pleasantly rhythmic. However, there are other melodies of quite different kind. And if you look at Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, they will greet you in a thousand different forms. Then hopefully, you will soon become weary of the meager monotony of the latest Italian opera melodies. Huh? Can you imagine? This is Robert Schumann. And he he's talking about a time where Rossini and Verdi were already <laughs> big stars in Italy. When uh, I, um, I approached a, a certain school in a town, Mülheim, which was only uh, I think like 30 kilometers from Freiburg. 
The director was so happy, he barely glanced at my records. You know, the, the, the mere fact that I was Italian and I had uh, uh, a degree in classical guitar was enough for him. You know, he hired me on the spot, you know, right away. And um, even though I didn't speak one word of German, you know, I had my girlfriend with him uh, so that she could interpret what he was saying for me. <laughs> uh, but that was not a problem, you know. I used to teach, you know, uh, speaking a little bit of French and uh, English and, uh, you know, as a good, any good Italian with my hands, you know, <laughs> and everything. But, uh, of course, I did study German at that point by myself, naturally. I remember I bought a detective story. I couldn't understand a thing, you know, but I started reading it with a grammar book and a dictionary. And uh, that actually seemed to work. You know, I didn't have too much time. I wanted to become, you know, partially proficient as soon as possible. And I must say that after a couple of months, you know, I, I could already get by decently. But uh, um, Freiburg was really, really a fun town. I mean, uh, I met a lot of young people, musicians, you know, mainly uh, jazz musicians because, you know, I, like I said, I played a lot of, uh, of, um, of Brazilian music and there were a few clubs there. But the whole atmosphere in, in town was so, so interesting, so relaxed and hip and uh, intellectual, but, uh, you know, intellectual good, you know what I mean? Uh, I remember that there was a little joint where I used to play, um, and one night I went there, and, and the, the place is closed, you know, there was a sign that said, Sind alle auf eine Fete, we closed, we all went to a party. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> that was the type of atmosphere that reigned in the city of Freiburg. But then something happened. You know, I had to serve in the military because in uh, in Italy back then it was mandatory. So I know that my parents got uh, the card, the famous card, that summoned me to, you know, to wherever I was supposed to go. So now I'm in Germany, but I don't really... And there was no European uh, Union back then. You know, remember, Germany was a separate country. You know, you had to go through customs and everything. You needed a passport. So um, I really didn't want to serve in the army. So I went to the Italian consulate and I explained my situation. I remember I was... I think I was 25 years old. Yeah. I explained my whole situation. I said, what can I do? And they said, look, Paul, you have three options here. The first one is that you go back to Italy and you serve in the army. The second is that uh, you don't go. You do whatever you want, but you have to realize that whenever you cross the border, if they catch you, they will arrest you. <laughs> and the third one is staying here until you're 30 years of age. And then you're cool. But in the meantime, you can go back uh, to Italy. If you do, then option two applies. <laughs> so... I scratched my head and I said to myself, you know what, I don't want to stay here until I'm 30 years of age. I mean, Germany's cool, but I want to have the option of going back to Italy <laughs> every once in a while. So I decided to go back to Italy. I served in the army and during the time also my, my, my father died, you know, and uh, I had to take care of him. Uh, you know, I spent uh, the last day of his life with him in the hospital. 
And then at the end of the military service, uh, I decided to go back to Germany, of course. But um, the same thing happened that had happened in Italy. In other words, Freiburg was a really a fun town. It was very, very nice, but it was not a big city. You know, the, 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 scene, when, the scene there was kind of limited. So I said to myself, I want to go to Munich. And we didn't move to Munich. First of all, I found a job in another music school. Same thing, you know, it was very easy. You know, uh, I had to teach like three, four times a week. So I had a lot of time for myself and I, and I could play, you know. Uh, I remember I was playing regularly in uh, two Latin American joints. La Cumbia was one and La Peseta Loca was the other one <laughs> so we, that was an interesting uh, uh, format you know whereby you would play like 20 minutes there were a bunch of musicians you know so I was waiting in what you would call backstage you know and then at some point you know the guy would call me Enrico venga and I would get up on stage and play mainly Brazilian tunes. So living in Munich was nice, but at some point I started getting itchy. You know, I always had this this desire to change, to explore something different, something new. So uh, I said to my girlfriend, her name was Fuzi, hey listen, you know, we've been living in Germany for some time. How about living in Italy? You know, let's try. So we just packed and uh, went to Rome. In Rome, I went back to the uh, to the area where I had lived before, Campo di Fiori, which is really really beautiful, in a small hotel. And at that time, you know, the prices were so low. Uh, so. Um, I started getting back into the scene. I started seeing all the people that uh, uh, that I knew uh, from before, and uh, especially my friend Michele Ascolese. Michele Ascolese was actually is one of the uh, best guitar players in Italy, and uh, I would often go to his house. And one day, uh, he played this record for me. And uh, that, that, that was great. I mean, I was really very, very impressed. There was Tit Stillman playing with Bill Evans. Of course, I knew of Toots from before, but I mean, this, this record was, uh, was so beautiful, so, so deep, that uh, I fell in love once and for all with the harmonic. I decided to play. So I bought one and I started practicing. Meanwhile, I would do my thing, you know, I would teach a little bit, you know, mainly classical guitar. You see, the relationship with, uh, with, uh, with Michele was based on this common link, the guitar. Uh, he was a jazz guitar player, so I envied his, his, his improvisation and he and with my, uh, my classical technique, the beautiful sounds that I could get out of a classical guitar. And uh, so we would hang out, you know, I would, mm, I would go to all the clubs where he, where he was playing. And in the meantime, I was practicing my harmonic. My love story with, with, with Susie f fell apart. I don't even know why. Someone from, from, from the township of Cosenza asked me to put together a music festival, and I did. You know, I started making phone calls, you know, mainly in Rome, and I put together a real nice festival uh, with a, a Renaissance group that played period instruments, uh, a Latin band, uh, some jazz, you know, a lot of stuff. You know, I was still searching. I, 
I didn't know uh, what I really wanted to do, so I would go back and forth, you know, from Rome to Cosenza. There was one summer um, that uh, I got a job uh, in Ischia. You know, Ischia is one of the uh, three islands by Naples, you know. Uh, the most famous, of course, is Capri, you know. And then you have Procida and Ischia. And I went there for uh, to attend a jazz festival, you know, I mean, just to listen to the music. And this guy picks me up and he says, so what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a musician. Oh, really? You know, I have a, I have a little taverna, you know, I'd like to have uh, live music there. Would you like to do it? And he offered me uh, a job for the whole summer. You know, room and board, you know, plus... Uh, you know, my salary. I spent about three months in Ischia. That was nice. Now, you have to understand that Ischia is, is like a German colony. You know, it's funny because you go to Capri and everybody speaks English. You know, you see signs in English and, uh, and, and Italian. If you go to Ischia, everybody speaks German and you see all the signs in Italian and German. So, of course, I started making friends uh, again uh, with, uh, with German people. And to make a long story short, I ended up in Munich again. I said to myself, you know, I have nothing to lose. I don't have any, any steady situations. You know, let me see uh, what I can do in Germany. And I spoke the language. I, I knew a few people. Let me see what happens. I went to Munich. And after about one month, you know, I was kind of depressed because things didn't happen as fast as I had uh, hoped. And uh, one day, I called my mother. Now, you have to understand that my mother never really worried too much about me. You know, I was, uh, uh, I was very independent. I would travel all the time, you know, and for weeks and weeks I wouldn't call. You know, she didn't worry. She knew that... Uh, that I was okay. I go home and my sister answers the phone and she, and she says, she's, she sounded alone. She said, where are you? Where have you been all this time? I said, well, I mean, I'm in Munich right now. She's in Munich. What, what are you doing in Munich? Well, you know, just hanging out. And she said, you know what? Pippo Caruso called you from Rome. He wanted to uh, offer you a contract on TV. And, uh, but, uh, I didn't know where you were. So, you know, I said, I'm sorry, you know, I can help you. Now, I was so lucky that I, I called home, like, maybe two days after this phone call. And I didn't have Pippo Caruso's phone number, you know, this great arranger, who incidentally knew me from before, because he had invited me to play Baroque guitar in one of, these, of his shows. But uh, a few years down the line, he hears a harmonica uh, backing a blues singer that was invited to, um, um, to a show uh, on TV. And uh, he wants to know who the harmonica player is. Because you have to understand that back then in Italy, very often... Um, there was no live music. I mean, it was n not a rule, but in in many in, in many programs there was there was no live music. In other words, people pretended that they were playing, but uh, in fact, you know, they were lip syncing, you know, something like that. But there was no uh, no real negative stigma on that. You know, it was just a, a fact of life. So, uh, this singer was invited, and of course they played the recording. You know, she pretended she was singing live, but uh, they were playing the recording, and he heard my harmonica. And he said, I want this guy. Who's this guy? And they told me, uh, they told him, oh, you know, his, his name is Enrico Granafe. Enrico Granafe, but I know Enrico Granafe. Uh, uh, he plays the, the guitar. And they said, well, actually, now he plays harmonica, too. At the end of the contract on TV, I could have taken advantage of the situation, of the connections that I had. Any sensible person would have done that. <laughs> well, not this guy. 
<laughs> so, uh, what did I do? I left everything and uh, I went to the US. I was lucky enough because um, on a gig that I had in Florence, I had met a couple of American girls from New York and uh, I kept in touch with them. So when I decided that I wanted to go uh, to the States, I, I wrote and I said, hey, uh, I'm coming. So could you please help me to find a place, you know, uh, to stay, not too expensive. So one of the girls writes back and says, well, it just so happens that my father is the owner of a building <laughs> on 48th Street between 1st and 2nd and there is one apartment for rent if you want it it's 400 bucks a month I said my god I couldn't believe it <laughs> so you know I I had always lived with other people now my first apartment all by myself was in New York City across the street from the United Nations. Hmm, not bad, eh? My life in the United States started. But my very first job had absolutely nothing to do with jazz. I had the uh, phone number of this girl who was the, the leader of a group called I Giullari di Piazza, the Jesters of the Square. It was a great group that did uh, Italian um, traditional music and also Commedia dell'arte, you know, the theatrical Renaissance tradition. And uh, so I called her up and, uh, you know, I got a job right away. <laughs> uh, of course, I was... I, I had gone there because I wanted to, to play jazz, but, you know, I was a musician, you know, I, I was Italian, and I knew Italian music, and said, okay, that's great. So I worked with this group for a while, first only as a musician, later on I became an actor, you know, I was impersonating Pulcinella, <laughs> And, uh, you know, Commedia dell'arte uh, is based a lot on improvisation. In the meantime, you know, I was uh, going around to jazz clubs and, you know, to see uh, what the scene was like. And uh, before uh, I had gone to the States, when I was in Italy, I had the, the funny idea that maybe... Uh, in, 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 in New York, you know, I could find a lot of great jazz harmonica players. Because, you see, don't forget, I, in Italy, I was basically really the only one, the only uh, jazz harmonica player who had uh, uh, developed uh, uh, a considerable level of proficiency. There was another guy, you know, who was uh, much older than me, who had done a lot of recordings with great pop singers, but, you know, he he was all right, you know. I mean, I ended up meeting him in Milan uh, one time, and I remember that we jammed. Now, I get to New York City, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, there must be a lot of great harmonica players here. Well, guess what? It was nothing. I mean, I couldn't meet one jazz harmonica player not one so now let me clarify one thing of course there were harmonica players but i didn't know them they were not visible the reason being that they were all among themselves they belonged to uh, um, clubs and associations but they were not visible you know on uh, on the scene like in new york city there was a publication called the village voice and you would go through the pages and you would see what was going on in new york city every single night you know there was a lot of stuff but uh, not one jazz harmonica player i mean i never saw one you know it took me a couple of decades to even find out uh, that they existed one night i was walking around in the village and uh i was speaking you know in this joint 
at the corner of Bleecker Street and LaGuardia. And what do I see? I see somebody on stage playing harmonica. It was visibly a chromatic harmonica. And he had a, a, a jazz trio behind. I said, oh my God, finally. So I walked in and he was playing some jazz material. Oh, I listened to the set and um, at the end of the set, I went over, I introduced myself and I said, hi, you know, I'm a jazz harmonica player from Italy. He says, uh, do you play diatonic? I said, no, 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 I play chromatic. Okay, come with me. He took me outside and he said, why don't you play something for me? So basically he auditioned me <laughs> by the door. So I, <laughs> I picked up my harmonic and I, I played a couple of phrases and, and William, his name was William Gallison. He said, okay, okay, come with me. Tonight you're playing with me. So he went on stage and, uh, you know, introduced me, said, this is the first time I had never uh, met um, any other harmonica player, jazz harmonica player, so it's a real pleasure to have one, you know, we're going to do something together. <laughs> so uh, from that moment on, I, I, I kept going around, you know, looking for clubs where they had gem sessions. By, back then, there were, there were a lot of gem sessions in New York City. So I would, um, you know, I would try and play uh, whenever and wherever I could. But uh, in the following years, I did some crazy stuff. I mean, stuff that I would never advise anybody any young musician to do but to me you know at that time uh, it felt right whatever i was doing you know it was like a, an angel was watching over me all the time so one night i found out that uh, um that Mark Johnson was playing in a, in a joint on university place called Knickerbocker with, uh, with this young pianist, Fred Hirsch. Now, I knew of uh, Mark Johnson because he had played with the legendary Bill Evans, and he played with him until Bill died, you know, which was a few years uh, earlier. So he was, um, he was very well known. So I said to myself, okay, I want to hear this guy. So I went there with uh, my girlfriend at that time, who eventually became my wife, uh, Christine, um, whom I had met uh, on a concert that I was doing with the Giullari di Piazza, you know, this Italian group uh, that she knew very well and she was following. So I went to the Knickerbocker with Christine and her friend, and I selected a table by the stage. I heard the notes of Alice in Wonderland a standard that every jazz musician plays and of course I knew the tune so I just uh, picked up my harmonic and I started playing along now, you have to understand that you just don't do this it's uh, uh, it's rude it's uh, not appropriate and uh, you can get into trouble big time for something like that but I don't know, it, it just felt so right. Uh, after a few seconds, I saw a smile on their faces. I understood that it was okay. And I kept playing. And at the end of the tune, they asked me if I wanted to play more, <laughs> which I did. Now, what I did not know, and uh, I was told that later, actually, I read that later uh, in... Uh, in an account of the of this, uh, I don't know, you can call it incident or occurrence. But anyway, um, I learned that the uh, that the owner of the joint went to Fred and said, "Shall I throw him out?" And uh, Fred shook his head, signifying that uh, an expected guest should be allowed to play. <laughs> So, um, at the end of the set, we get together, you know, at my table, and uh, we exchange phone numbers. And later on, Fred asked me to, um, he said, he said, look, I, I have a studio in my apartment. He had an apartment in Soho. Uh, if you don't have a demo, it's important that you have one 
why don't you just come to my house, uh, just get a, a couple of musicians, you know, a bass player and a drummer, I will play piano for you, and uh, you don't have to pay me either for my piano playing uh, or for, for, for the use of the studio, you know, I'll just do it for you, you know, free of charge. I said, okay, great. So I did the, dem the demo, which later on became a record. And that was my first record. I did it in 1987. And uh, I basically created my own label. There was vinyl, you know, at, the, at that point. And uh, not having a major label, it's, it's very difficult because you have to do a lot of work. You have to send uh, records to all the reviewers uh, all over the country or sometimes all over the world and uh, hope that some of them will, uh, uh, will write about it. Same thing for radio stations. But uh, I got the record on WBGO and I got a lot of nice reviews, you know, that paved the way for, for, uh, for my future uh, activity. Another time I went to see the famous Cuban saxophonist Paquito de Rivera at the Apollo Theater. So I went there. Uh, at the end of the concert, I, um, I went around the building waiting for him to come out. So I'm in this dark street in the middle of Harlem, and I'm waiting for pa pa Paquito to come out. Eventually Paquito comes out with the saxophone in his hand, and as soon as, he, as soon as I see him, I start playing on the harmonica Brussels in the Rain, which was a tune that he had written for Toots Stillman's and actually had recorded with him. So, I mean, that, this scene was very surrealistic. You know, can you imagine in, in, in the middle of Harlem in, in, in the dark, you know, Paquita de Rivera standing there in the middle of the street with a saxophone and me serenading him with one of his tunes. So uh, at the end of the tune, you know, he smiled, you know, we exchanged a, a few words. And as a result of that crazy move, he invited me to sit in with his quintet at the Blue Note who was already, back then, you know, the, the, the most important uh, jazz club, not only in New York, I would say uh, in, um, in the world. So um, here I am at the Blue Note playing with Paquito, who introduces me, you know, we have this guy from Italy. Well, eventually, um, what happened is that when I did my, uh, my, my record uh, with... Um, with Mark Johnson, Fred Hirsch, and Adam Nussbaum, who was an upcoming drummer, was already playing with the best. You know, he he was playing with Michael Brecker, you know, so he was already a celebrity, you know, and I, I had met him uh, at a jam session. He was playing at a jam session. He was the house drummer. And I went there, you know, we make friends, we exchange phone numbers and, and stuff. Uh, so eventually I decided to do this record uh, that, um, as I said, uh, you know, gave me uh, some mileage. But I think that the, the funniest episode was when, uh, when one night I was walking around in Soho. It must have been around midnight. I walk into a bar and there were only two customers, the owner, bartender, and a guy who was totally wasted, you know, behind the piano, playing, you know, not very well, actually. So he was playing some jazz standards, so I, you know, I started playing along with my harmonica. And the guy was smiling at me, and at the end of the tune he said, You know what? So I never heard anybody play the harmonica like you, except for Toots Dillemans. And if Jaco Pastorio tells you, you can believe it. So I figured the guy's drunk, you know, he thinks it's Jaco Pastorius. Also because I did not know back then what uh, Jaco looked like. I was familiar with his music. But remember, there was no internet. I mean, you know, you want to, I mean, you could 
hear a record and appreciate the music but if you wanted to know if the if the picture of the of the artist was not on the record you really had to go out of your way to to find out what the what the person looked like so i figured you know he's wasted and he thinks it's jaco so i keep playing you know and uh, at some point, I strike a conversation with the owner who says to me, Hey, you see, tonight we have a celebrity here. And I was looking around and said, Who's the celebrity? He said, What? You don't know Jaco Pistorius? I said, Holy cow. So he was really Jaco. <laughs> I had been jamming with Jaco, whom I saw eventually, um, actually not long before he died. I remember I, I gave him a tape. Uh, but then I don't know what happened because the poor guy ended up in that uh, uh, dreadful manner. <laughs> in those times you know like cassettes <laughs> i give a lot of tapes you know i give one to jacob pastorius i give one to gil evans uh whose drummer had actually recommended me you know um uh, adam nussbaum saying nice things about me uh, <clears throat> i gave a tape to um to mel lewis to herbie man to emily rambler was a young upcoming a guitar player who, who unfortunately died in, in an accident. She was very young. But anyway, all these people at some point passed away. I hope they did not pass pass away because of the tapes that I, that I gave them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just a fact. And, um, of course, I was doing other things. You know, I, I decided that one of the skills that I should definitely used to make money was uh, uh, my love for languages so I ended up interpreting I did some court interpreting also social security hearings all over New Jersey and uh, New York City and all the five boroughs this country has always been very very pragmatic you know if you know how to do something you know, they just let you do it and that's it so there was no certification at least for 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 some languages you know there was no certification for Italian so when I was offered to uh, to work as a freelance interpreter I jumped on the occasion and said yeah why not I was a little perplexed because I had never done it before but you know there's a first time for everything as you know you have uh, simultaneous interpreting and consecutive interpreting. Now, in the consecutive interpreting, you have to wait a little bit and then translate whatever was said. Whereas, if you uh, uh, if you um, interpret simultaneously, uh, um, you always uh, like uh, just a few words behind, you know. Uh, but that kind of interpreting sometimes can be annoying for some people, and that was a problem for me, because if I waited too long, you know, I didn't remember all the things they 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 they, they were said, so I had to to interpret simultaneously, uh, uh, hoping that they would not uh, bother anybody, because sometimes you know hearing these two voices at the same time can can be a little bit of a problem. And uh, I did a lot of very, very heavy stuff. You know, I worked on some mafia cases and uh, 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 a lot of depositions. Uh, you know, EBTs, as they call them in New York City, examination before trial. Uh, and uh, if I wanted to write a book on my interpreting stories, I could do that because um, 
I had a lot of an interesting and also very, very funny experiences. So one day I was working on, on a case. I was in the courtroom interpreting for a witness um, who was there, who was present when a certain accident uh, took place. Basically, um, there was a company that was demolishing a building. And they were working on the last two floors of the building. Uh, when all of a sudden the ceiling of the top uh, of the top floor collapsed, and many people got in injured. So they were trying to recreate the scene to understand exactly what happened, and, and they were questioning uh, uh, this guy from the province of Enna who could not speak one word of English or of Italian for that matter. He could only uh, speak his own dialect, you know, which was no problem for me because I'm from the south, I'm from the, the next region, from Calabria, so I understood everything perfectly. There was no problem. So what happened when the, uh, when the ceiling collapsed, uh, a bunch of people who were downstairs went upstairs to see uh, to see what was going on and he was one of them but the guy uh, didn't seem to understand why he was there I mean he was totally uh, uh, totally enraged you know he he was sitting there uh, next to the judge and some stupid guy was asking stupid questions and he could not understand why. You know, I'm trying to interpret what I was, what I was reading in his eyes, you know. So with each question, he grew angrier and angrier. So the attorney uh, says, uh, okay, so at some point, uh, 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 what happened? When were you uh, aware that there was something wrong going on? So well, you know, I was working and uh, I heard the noise from from upstairs. So what did you hear when you heard the noise? Well, I went upstairs. Now at this point, <laughs> the attorney asks him, "How did you get upstairs?" Oh man, you should have seen his face. He looked at me. He looked at the judge. He looked at the jury, and then he blurts. How was I supposed to go by train? <laughs> and I translated literally. Everybody starts laughing. I mean, for five minutes, nobody could do anything but laugh. You know, the judge, the attorney, the jury, <laughs> myself. I mean, it was absolutely hilarious. I met Carlo Pagnotta in New York City. Carlo Pagnotta was the head, is actually still the head of the most important Italian jazz festival, Umbria Jazz. And of course, I was, I was hoping to get a gig, but you know the saying that goes "Nemo profeta in patria." I was Italian, so you know he was not very inclined to to give me a gig. He came here on business, you know, trying to book. American artists, but he did offer me a job though. He said, Look, why don't you work as an interpreter for the Berkeley College of Music? Uh, Berkeley uh, was running a summer workshop in Italy, and uh, all the teachers, all the American teachers that went there, obviously, none of them, well, almost none spoke Italian. Except for for a couple who were actually Italians who came to America, so you know, ended up getting it, getting jobs as uh, as professors at Berkeley. But anyway, most of them did not speak Italian. Um, I ended up becoming actually the head interpreter uh, there, um, something that I did for four years. It was very nice, very interesting because uh, I got a chance. Uh, to play too, especially when, you know, when they would hire <laughs> my friends, people from here that I knew very well, like uh, Paquito de Rivera, you know, he would invite me to uh, to play uh, with him and his quintet, 
a, in a jazz club, but not only in a jazz club, actually, he was the one who uh, concluded the festival with the, with a performance on the main stage. And during that performance, actually, he invited me to play something uh, with the band. And during um, uh, the last year, I uh, happened to meet Momo Mormila, who was a young guy who was trying to create uh, a jazz festival in, um, in Veneto. And he asked me if I wanted to work with him, and I, if, if I could help him uh, to set things up. So I said, sure, why not? And I ended up uh, setting up a workshop of the Manhattan School of Music. And um, we did basically the same thing that Berkeley was doing in Perugia. We did it in, um, in, in, um, in Veneto, in Castelfranco Veneto. A lot of great concerts in the festival. You know, Keith, Keith Jarrett played there a few times, uh, Pat Metheny, you know, you name it. Well, there, actually, I, uh, I had opportun more opportunities than in Perugia to, to play with my own band. Uh, which I did, you know, was nice exposure, you know, with uh, good articles that came out uh, in the press. There were periods where I didn't really play too much jazz, but I was still doing things, experimenting. Uh, I went back to classical guitar a couple of times, you know, uh, until I discovered 19th century guitar and I started singing songs accompanying myself with my 19th century guitar and uh, I kept playing Italian music also working as an actor doing Commedia dell'arte with this group uh, that I had met initially Giullari di Piazza and then something significant happened in 1999 we opened a jazz club which was already the best uh, jazz club in New Jersey. It was a place where I used to get gigs. Uh, but uh, when it shut down, uh, Christine, my wife, decided that maybe we should reopen the place. I guess uh, she figures, you know, I have a, uh, a starving musician as a husband we might as well give him a job, a real job. <laughs> she didn't know what she was going to get into, <laughs> obviously. By the way, that expression, starving musician, is something that I learned here. I never considered myself a starving musician when I was in Europe. And actually, I never starved, you know, I was always okay. After a couple of years, I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. There was a time that I was literally crying on a daily basis. <laughs> it was very, very difficult for me. You know, being a musician my entire life, now all of a sudden I'm a businessman. Oh, that was not easy. That was not easy. Uh, although, it was obviously nice to have great music, because let's face it, I mean, the... Uh, the level of musicianship that you can find in the New York metropolitan area is definitely the highest in the world. So that was nice. And uh, I knew the scene, I knew the musicians, you know, most of them were already my friends. So uh, I didn't have a problem booking the place. Uh, but uh, the rest was tough. It was, was really, really difficult. You know, initially, I mean, we didn't have too many problems because the place already had a reputation. Uh, it was the number one, actually the number, I, I, I'd say the only jazz club in the state of New Jersey. And it remained for, 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 for several years that the only real jazz club, I'm not talking about a restaurant with music, I'm talking about a real jazz club with stage, the spotlights and everything. It stayed there, you know, till the end. 
So the place had a reputation and a lot of great musicians that played there, like, um, I don't know, Wynton Marsalis, Gatto Barbieri, uh, Astro Gilberto. I only had to follow, to follow that tradition. So I didn't have to create anything from scratch. But it was still difficult. Running a jazz club is like running a theater and a restaurant at the same time. Christine was doing a great job uh, too, although she was a full-time teacher. So, you know, theoretically it was more difficult for her, but uh, practically it was more difficult for me because she had the entrepreneurial mentality. Uh, I did not. Like I said, at, at some point I plunged into a deep state of depression. And it was very, very difficult to get out of it. But I did. And uh, this happened uh, quite a few years after uh, I had graduated in, uh, uh, from the Manhattan School of Music with a master's degree in jazz performance, where I started with Tud Stillman's, my idol. I was not aware of the existence of this this harmonica underworld because it was really an underworld. Now remember, for decades I only knew Toots. He was the only one who's who was present on the international scene. But this friend of mine uh, was a piano tuner uh, who got into the, the harmonica very heavily, and he started. Uh, exploring uh, this underworld uh, he introduced me to to all these people you know who uh, would get together and play harmonic people whose existence I was absolutely unaware of and uh, uh, one day he managed to convince me uh, to attend um, the spa convention Spa is the, the most important harmonic organization. And that year, um, remember, I didn't know anything about Spa, about harmonic associations, absolutely nothing. You know, I was concerned with, the, with, the, with what was happening in the Big Apple, you know, uh, the jazz world and, and stuff. And, Basically, I didn't know any harmonica players. You know, I knew Toots because he was an international star, and I knew William Gallison because I bumped into him one night uh, when he was playing uh, um, in this joint on, on Bleecker Street. So Bob, this was his name, um, convinced me to attend uh, the spa convention that was taking place that year, I think it must have been in the year 2000, I'm not sure, but anyway, he convinced me to go uh, to Dallas um, to attend the convention. And uh, it was there uh, that I met somebody who would become particularly significant in my life, Vern Smith. So one day, I see this little guy playing harmonica, you know, uh, with the rack, you know, I'm playing guitar at the same time. And I immediately realized that he was, that was a chromatic harmonica, so I was kind of intrigued, you know. Now, you have to understand that many people through the years had the dream of uh, building a, a hands free chromatic harmonica. And everybody came up with the same concept. Uh, a foot pedal that could push the slide. You know, the harmonica is this slide on the, on the right that you have to push, you know, if you want to play the chromaticisms. Uh, but this harmonica did not have a slide. He had, he had a movable mouthpiece. So Vern told me, he said, oh, please give it a shot, you know, try, which I did. So at this point, I think I have to explain something about the harmonica. There are 
several types of harmonicas, but mainly uh, the two most important ones are the diatonic and the chromatic. So the diatonic is uh, um, a harmonica where you can play only diatonically. In other words, if you imagine a keyboard, you can play only the white keys. So the diatonic harmonica doesn't have any black keys. Therefore, it's kind of limited. The, 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 there's only certain things that you can do. You can play certain folk songs, you can play blues, you know, using the appropriate bending. And then there's the chromatic harmonica uh, that has um, also the black keys of the piano, you know. This is, this is the smallest harmonica, you know. <laughs> it's more than a toy, it's used uh, mostly as an ornament, you know, as a, as a pendant, you know, but he actually plays. You know, <laughs> so and uh, it's diatonic, of course. Then you have this, you know, this is a uh, also diatonic harmonica, which is used to play blues. You know, this is not an instrument that I I can I can play very well. Actually, went straight to the chromatic harmonica, so this is my bag. You know, this is my instrument. Um, I play by pressing the slide. Now, what this slide does, it has, it allows you to play chromatically. So you have basically two uh, reed plates. This is, on top you have the C major diatonic scale and at the bottom you have the C sharp diatonic scale. So you can play uh, any note you want. You have four notes on every hole. Two blowing and two inhaling. Uh, and with this instrument you can play anything. I mean, it, it has the same range of the flute. It starts from the middle C going up three octaves. So, all the uh, classical literature for the flute, you can actually play it on the harmonic. And there are some classical players who, who do that. Then uh, there's another chromatic harmonica with an extra octave at the bottom. So with that, you can play also the violin literature. <laughs> so you can play anything. But anyway, uh, you know, it's a complete instrument, you know. When I met Vern Smith at the Harmonica Convention in Dallas, Texas, and he showed me uh, his invention. I fell in love with it. This instrument here is much more effective and simpler because you have a regular harmonica with the movable mouthpiece. All you do, you just push it down with your lips and that's it. So you don't have the movement that goes from the foot to the wire to uh, the button. So it's much faster, much more effective. Um, and when I first tried it, tried it I, I said, okay, well, you know, it can be done. I thought it was no big deal. You know, instead of going like this, I go like that and I can actually play a tune. You know, simple, right? And uh, uh, in fact, I was able to play a tune after just a couple of minutes, you know, with a few mistakes, but it, it was alright. 
then I decided to try playing a guitar at the same time and I almost fell off my chair I said this is impossible it's too complicated too difficult so um, I put the idea aside for approximately a couple of weeks <laughs> and then I started practicing and I started to understand what I could do to develop that kind of coordination when people see what I do uh, they um, generally not everybody but most of them they totally underestimate what's going on because they think of the blues players and folk players and uh, um, you know there's a lot of them so the image of someone playing harmonic and guitar at the same time uh, doesn't seem new however they're playing a diatonic harmonic and uh, so whenever I remember that whenever um, someone would see me they right away they would say oh yeah just like Bob Dylan you know um, and that uh, that comment haunted me for, for, for years so people have a hard time to understand like I said not everybody but sometimes they have a hard time to understand how much more difficult this is and that's why when I when I um, recorded my first CD see this one in search of the third dimension um, I decided uh, to call it like that uh, for the very simple reason that uh, there is a third dimension that had to be considered in the overall coordination so you have the harmonica you have the guitar and then you have the vertical dimension of the of the of the mouthpiece that goes up and down which um, you might not even notice when you see me play but it's very important and it adds to whatever the brain tells you to do at some point I ended up meeting somebody actually on the internet you know I didn't even meet him personally who was playing uh, an unusual type of guitar with two bass strings he, he called it the DB guitar because his name was Nico Di Battista you know a marvelous guitar player from Italy and uh, he developed this instrument where you can you know make it sound like you're playing a bass and a guitar at the same time you know this is the instrument I'm talking about you know oops here we go And uh, um, I said to myself, oh, my, this is great. I want to do this because this will give me the possibility of, uh, you know, sounding uh, uh, not only like, uh, like two people, but actually like three. So I had to develop the technique of a walking bass, which is something that not every great guitarist knows how to do. Um, I think the, the one who pioneered this technique on the guitar was Joe Pass. I, uh, I had to, uh, 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 to ask Vern to make adjustments on the instrument uh, because there were so many imperfections at the beginning. And uh, we were very far from each other because I live on the East Coast, he lives on the West Coast, he lives in California, so we would meet very, very seldom. Uh, I remember once I was so frustrated because uh, an instrument that, uh, that he had given me didn't work too well, so at some point I saw him 
uh, and uh, I was telling him what was wrong with it. He didn't even let me finish. He got another harmonic. Said, "I know, I know. Try this one." And of course, I tried that one, and it was it was it was good. It was much better. So we would communicate, and every once in a while we would see each other, and uh, uh, and uh, you know make necessary adjustments but I remember one thing in the very beginning Vern told me look Enrico I know that you're a very fast player but uh, you have to understand that you cannot play as fast with the uh, hands-free chromatic harmonic because your finger is uh, is lighter than your head so your head moving takes longer than your fingers so you cannot play as fast and i said to myself okay we'll see about that you know let me let me try then i understood that he was wrong because in fact i was not moving my head i was just moving my my lips because the movement is only four millimeters so i met Vern. A couple of months later and I said hey Vern look at this look what I do when I play something <laughs> rather fast and uh, Vern looked at me and then he goes oh my god you are my hero you are my hero because he realized that uh, uh, his own creation had even more possibilities than he had thought <laughs> Trumpets Jazz Club for exactly 20 years and um, I learned very soon that running a jazz club is not a very easy thing to do as a matter of fact just to give you an idea uh, at some point Trumpets was listed in the Downbeat magazine which is the the most important jazz publication in the world was listed as uh, one of the 200 best jazz clubs in the world. Now this happened three times in a row and uh, when I saw this nomination you know, I was laughing to myself because I was thinking that if you eliminate the word best, it's much closer to the truth. In other words, Trumpet Jazz Club was one of the 200 jazz clubs in the world. <laughs> New York City has, I don't know, over 10 million inhabitants. And there are thousands of musicians that come from all over the world just to be on the scene and play jazz. How can you, how can you imagine that there's only like 10 real jazz clubs? When I'm talking about the real full-time jazz clubs with a stage and everything, I'm not talking about restaurants that decided to have jazz for a little while and then they got sick of it and they uh, they dumped the music we had a selective a very selected audience you know of uh, of people who really enjoyed the music who wanted to come uh, because they loved jazz but dealing with uh, with the suppliers with uh, with the firemen with the chef with uh, with the waiters etc etc oh my god the relationship with the musicians was probably the best thing uh, mostly because many of them already knew me 
from before you know when i was only a musician on the scene i was not a club owner and sometimes you know i got invited to play to sit in on stage um although very often i would have like uh patronizing comments you know especially from people who didn't know me you know stuff like hey you're not bad for a club owner you know or hey you know you should keep playing please don't stop doing that you know because you you're pretty good <laughs> so after 20 years i said okay i've had enough i can't do this anymore you know christine wanted to keep the place open because uh, also because it was her private lounge and because uh, she enjoyed uh, supporting the arts uh, and all that stuff but uh, I was burnt out I was absolutely burnt out so I said the hell with this I want to close the place down and we did it actually at the at the right time uh, right before COVID so it would have happened anyway some people ask me today well don't you miss trumpets well you want to know the truth I don't I mean I truly appreciate what the trumpets meant for the community and I still have people you know thanking me for 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 the important role that uh, that I had supporting this great music but uh, I'd rather be a musician I think when I grow up that's what I want to do <laughs> <laughs>